series. We're starting a series called The Church Just Wants My Money. Because let me tell you something. You start talking about money in church and people freak out, man. They get nervous. They get anxious. I mean, there are folks running. You start talking about tithes and offerings. People run around here like a, like a pit bull in a canine factory. They don't know what to pee on. They don't know where to get going. So today, we're going to break the ice. We're going to get into it a little bit. But people are incredibly nervous, especially when you say the word rich in church. It's like, well, God didn't, God, I mean, he, he wants good things for us, but rich, I don't know if I, I can't agree with that, Pastor. Well, it depends on your definition of rich. And I want to talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about the idea of wealth. I want to talk about the idea of money in general, a generous heart. See, often when we talk about money in church, the, gener- the, the sermons become so generic, they're just about generosity. And generosity is a good thing. But they become this generic idea of, oh, just be generous. God loves a generous, cheerful giver. Hallelujah. Well, that's true. But if you read through the Bible and you start with Genesis, Adam was the first person created, then Eve was created. They were both created in an environment where there was no lack. Everything God created was at the will of Adam to do with what he pleased. Every need, every desire... Every want was already supplied for. In the beginning, this is how God's original intention started with man. That he would have every need provided for, every desire provided for. The first Adam was born into riches. God made, him, God made this earth and God made Adam for communion with God, and in that communion, there would be no lack. Nothing would be broken. That's the original intent. And God actually went a step further and said, Adam, it's not good for you to be alone, so he crafted the most beautiful woman ever, or at least until that point in history. Who knows afterwards? I don't know if God one-upped himself after or not. But the most beautiful woman in, in, in the history of the world and presented, him to Adam, presented her to Adam and said, this is yours and thus, the, the story of humanity started. Now, here's the problem. We get caught up when we talk about money and church and giving and church and finances and church because we think there's a finite limit to money. I'm going to tell you something. They print more money every day. There's no finite limit to money. Money, and, and, and again, the paper bills or coins or what, however you track your finances, That's just a tool. That's just a tool in our hands if it's understood properly. See, God literally tells us and tells Adam in the beginning, we're going to come back to this, we're going to get away from it and then come back to it. God tells Adam to, uh, let's see, be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish and subdue. It's the starting of the law of Genesis that everything reproduces after its own kind. And yet this law of Genesis and this command that was given to Adam that we'll later understand is the blessing of God, that it starts before the fall of man, yet continues in to the entirety of the biblical record that we have. Law of Genesis, everything reproduces after its own kind. And this law is instituted. It's, it's a foundational building block for us as Christians from the beginning until now. We'll never get away from this idea that everything reproduces after its own kind. So why can't you expect everything that you touch to prosper? I didn't say it would be easy, but why can't you expect what you touch, what you do, the focus of your intention to prosper? Most of us think it's a hit or miss game. Well, I'll do this job and hopefully it'll work out, or maybe I'll get another job and a raise and hopefully it'll work out, or maybe I'll go down this path or that path. No, why aren't you expecting that whatever you put your hand to do, it's going to do well? The Bible says that we should prosper in all that we do. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Malachi chapter 3. We're going to get there after a bit. Actually, we're going to come up to some other verses before that. Uh, But Malachi Malachi 3 is, is a good place to at least hold your finger. The reality is in the Bible, there are four types of giving, four different specific types of giving. Now, I want to be very honest with you. If we all gave exactly biblically every single year, it would likely take up about 40% of our income. And some of you are like, what? You're, you want us to do what now? 
No, we're going to get there in a minute, okay? We're going to talk about the steps to get there. But each of these four types of giving have motivation and promise behind them. There's a reason we do some of these types of giving, and there's a motivation, the motivation of our heart, and then there's a promise behind it, what God will do. When we understand them, we understand why they work. Now, most people are very familiar with one form of giving. They, they kind of know it as a general idea of giving. Some, some of us are familiar with all four. Some of us have heard of a few of these. We're not quite sure how they work. We're going to lay out over the next couple of weeks how all of these work together in tandem in our, in our giving life, okay? So I want you to understand biblically that these are written in Scripture. They have a specific purpose and function, and it's not just because the church needs to raise more money. As we go through this series, the reason the, the, the order of service is all goofed up today as we go through this service series, we're not going to take up an offering like we normally do with a little offering um, uh, message. We're not going to do that while we do this. You don't need to listen to someone talk about giving for 30 minutes and have another two to five minute small sermonette on giving as well. You don't need, we don't need to do that. That's just too much. But we really want you to understand that during this series that we are talking about money, we are talking about finances, we are talking about generosity, but we're not trying to manipulate you. Anything we talk about is from a biblical perspective. I'm not here to try to get more money out of you. So the four types of giving are this. There's a tithe. There's the first fruits. There's the alms. Those three are specific through the New Testament and the Old Testament. Then there's the seed, which comes to play in the New Testament. We'll talk about that as well. The four types of giving, three of them go directly to God. One doesn't go to God at all. It goes to your fellow man. We'll talk about that here in a second as well. Of the four types of giving, there's only one where the Bible says you have to explicitly give to the church. There's only one. So if we walk through these four types of giving, you say, Pastor, you just want more of my money. That's all this is about. Nope. The Bible only says one of those even, even talks about the church. Everything else is kind of on a case-by-case -case basis of where God would lead you to give, Okay. So I want you to understand that from a biblical perspective, I'm not trying to manipulate you into more money. That's really not the issue here. Let's see if there's a move here. So most people understand the idea of the alms or giving to the poor. Most people struggle with the idea of the tithe, 10%. That seems like a lot. Most people don't particularly like the idea of first fruits when we talk about the, the biblical definition there. And most people think that seed giving or seed faith giving is akin to gambling. It's a shot in the dark. It's whatever will happen will happen. <clears throat> so if you have your Bible, Psalms chapter, let's go to 89 and, uh, and 89 and verse 34. We'll get there. And um, I know we'll go back to Malachi here in a second. Um, but let's see. Well, you know what? I don't know. Let's... Uh, Let's skip that. Let's skip that for a second. Let's go, yeah, let's go to, well, we'll go to Psalms then. Okay, so in Psalms, this is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, my covenant will I not break nor alter the things that go out of my lips. Now, specifically, God was speaking this to who? Did anyone, does anyone know who wrote the Psalms? David, okay. So God was speaking specifically to David. The covenant, my covenant will I not break, nor alter what has gone out of my lips. But what he is saying is setting a standard of who God is in this brief little paragraph, in this brief little uh, couple of lines. He's saying, listen, I'm God. I'm not going to go back on my word. And once I say a thing, it is established. It's written in heaven and on earth permanently. So then we go back to the scriptures and understand what God's saying. We have to recognize there's a reason for him to say what he's saying. Okay. This is why we titled the series, The Church Just Wants My Money. In fact, can I get my water there for a second? The Church Just Wants My Money. Well, in other words, what we're saying is, and what many people are saying is when they, when they give that statement, let me open this up, when they give that statement or they think that thought, what they're saying is, why isn't my giving working? I've heard series on tithes and offerings and generosity and seed and first, I've heard sermons on these. What gives, Pastor? Why isn't it working? I'll be real honest with you. There's a whole bunch of people that screw up how these giving modes in the Bible actually work. You know, there's a whole bunch of folks that will take their tithe and give it as alms or give to the poor and then expect the benefits of the tithe. God didn't say that's how it works. 
Or folks will give of their first fruits and give it in a, in a different manner, maybe even towards a tithe, and then wonder, well, God, you said if, if we gave in a first fruits manner, you'd bless us this way. How come it's not working? It's not God's fault. Learn what you're doing. Learn how these modes of giving operate. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, uh, it'll come up on the screen here in a second, but the first thing that Malachi asks is, will a man rob God? The answer is yes, you will. Yes, all of us will. That's a rhetorical question, and he knows the answer, yes. Why? Because we figure that God is not going to come down and do anything about it. That's the fact of the matter. We think in our finite human minds, we think that God's not going to do anything. He said, a, he said a standard, but we're not going to abide by that. God's just going to do what he's going to do. I totally forgot to put on my pack and everything today. I'm all weirded out. Do you want me to change this or not? I'm good? Okay. So God does have the power to arrest you in the moment and force you to give and force you to write the check and force you to parse out some of your income and make it a priority. God can do that to you in a minute. But God also gives you free will. He gives you free will to choose, and you get to decide based on hearing the word what you would decide to do. He always, always, always lets us make the choice. So Malachi, will a man rob God? Well, obviously the answer is yes, you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing from me, the whole nation of you. Now look at this verse for a second. It's, it's incredibly poignant. It goes right to the core of the issue. Will a man rob God? Yes, how are we doing? So you're not giving the way you've been instructed to give through tithes and offerings. We'll talk about what that means in a second. But it also goes on to say that the whole nation of you is robbing him. We tend to think that this motivation in robbing God and not doing what God's asked us to do with our finances is only to those people who are the newbies in church. We've got to teach them well. And we think a lot of times that the only people who are not on par with their finances and God are those who are the heathen, who are lost. Of course they don't give. They don't know God. Sometimes we think that it's only those jokers who are playing church and they're not really invested. No, the Bible says here that you have robbed him. You have robbed him when you haven't done what he's asked you to do according to his edicts with your money. And he says not just some of you, but the whole nation of you. That means the pastor... When he doesn't do it, has robbed God. That means the eldership, if they don't do what God's called them to do, has robbed God. That means every leader in church, when they haven't done what God has asked them to do financially, they have robbed God. He doesn't leave a single person out. He says the whole of you, the lot of you, the entire group of you. So don't feel bad if this applies to you. It applies to all of us at times. I think sometimes we, we want the message of giving to be one where God, you know, just says, hey, give me a little bit, like a tip here or there, and it'll be good. We'll be good. Like wad up a couple $1 bills, throw it in the offering, and we're good for another week. Unfortunately, his standard's a little higher than that. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that you, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing until it overflows or one that you can't contain. Now, we love this part of the scripture. God, I want the blessing. Ooh, Jesus. I want the blessing so big it'll overflow. God, help me win the lottery this week. Scratch off those tickets, Jesus. Let's go. Mama needs a new pair of shoes and a muffler. Come on. A purse. I, did. I heard that. Who said that? <laughs> I'm going to give you something that is so big that you can't contain it. Yet it hinges on a principle called the tithe. Specifically tithes and offerings. We'll get to that in a minute too. But specifically a principle called the tithe. Well, what is a tithe? Tithe is 10% of the sanctified gross income. Gross. Ugh, I don't like that word. It's gross. No, <laughs> gross income. I wish it was after taxes and after you paid your bills and the little bit you had left over. I wish that's how it worked. According to Jewish tradition, they were to take the tithe as the first bill they paid. And it's not bill pay, but I'll give you the idea. The first thing they did with their money was to honor God with the tithe. Take off the 10% before he did anything else. And then it says to bring it into the storehouse. Storehouse principle. That there what? Might be meat in my house. Why is that? Because the tithe goes into a general fund, which becomes the church's obligation to 
your fellow human, to humanity, to your brothers and sisters. We are able as a church based on tithes and offerings, not just to keep the lights on and build buildings. That's part of it because we want people to come and to hear the gospel, for their walls to come down, for kids to get blessed. That's all part of it. We also, because of the tithes and offerings of this church, have been able to give aid here locally and around the world to the tune. I should have gotten the amount 100%, but the tune of lots of money. Let's put it that way. We have given money away in, in ways and means that most of us, most of you here don't even understand. And, and I'll, I'll enlighten you a little bit. When we first started the church, we did everything we could to make sure that our website trended really high on Google search ranks, right? So if you church, searched uh, Quad Cities Church, Church in the Quad Cities, we would rank really high in the top five. There's, there's a side of that they don't tell you about. You get calls like every other day of people in need when you rank that high. Because folks who are in need go through the Rolodex of churches and need help. We have paid for folks to stay in motels. We have paid for water and light bills. We have paid for mattresses for kids who are sleeping on the floor. We have paid for bed linens. We have paid for adoption fees from kids from the Ukraine. We have paid for so many different things in this community and around the country and around the world. And it's because people were faithful to give because of the storehouse principle. We set aside money so that we can do good in the community. When people don't understand the meaning of the tithe, all they focus on is this one scripture here. God will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you can't contain. Why does God want to pour you out a blessing so big you, big you can't contain it? So you give it away. There's a different portion of scripture where God promises the Israelite people that when they take over the promised land, God is going to give them houses. He didn't say one house. He said, I'm going to give you houses. It's a really unique and fascinating idea for me that God would say, I'll give you vineyards and houses. He will give you a ways and a means in a multiplied sense on how to make an income and ways and means in which to live a, a sedentary, productive life. So much so that you'll have too much. Houses, vineyards. The reason we have a problem with that kind of language today in our culture, we don't trust ourselves with the excess. We think, and we know ourselves, that rather than give to the things that God would have us give to, rather than use our finances to bless other folks, we think of what we can buy next with it. And there's nothing wrong with that, except for when that next thing never satisfies you and you're constantly chasing the next thing. Recognizing that at some point, there needs to be something that goes back to God. In Deuteronomy, it says, you can eat the fat and drink the sweet, but don't forget your brother who's in need. The Bible doesn't say that there's anything wrong with wealth. In fact, many people perverted this scripture that money is the root of all evil. That's not what it says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Because then Solomon would be lying when he said that money answers all things. All things. I didn't write that. I don't have a trick Bible. Uh, we're mad here. All right. I don't know what I'm doing. You ever have one of those moments? I would say senior moment, but I'm not that old, so. I get in there, shut up. And he says in verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor, nor will the vineyards, your, vine, your vineyards, cast their grapes, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 12, all of the nations will call you blessed, and you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Okay. So we talk about the tithe specifically. We talk about will a man rob God? Yes, you will. Yes, 100% men will rob God. The entire nation at a time had robbed God. The entire people group that God was speaking to had robbed God. They weren't faithful with their tithes and offerings. We're all lumped into that idea. What is a tithe? 10% of the sanctified gross income. Then he says, if you are faithful in this practice, I will pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain. Then he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your namesake. I will rebuke anything that would steal away from you financial stability. Medical bills. Car repair issues. Stuff that just happens. And it starts to steal away our financial stability. God said he will guard against that. Why? Because of the tithe. In verse 12, it says, the nations of the world will call you blessed. You shall be a delightful land. 
God says that if you are faithful to the tithe, the world will recognize God's blessing on you. But what is the blessing? Such a generic term, pastor. I'm glad you asked. Because we sing about it, right? What's that song called, The Blessing? Uh, you know, the Carrie Job one that goes on and on and on for a thousand generations, right? <laughs> it's a good song. I'm just messing with Sarah. But the fact of the matter is we have a motivation behind tithing. If you read all of what's in Malachi, what is the simple motivation? Will a man rob God, meaning you haven't been obedient. The simple motivation behind tithing is obedience, just to do what God said to do, just to obey him in what he's asked of you. The, 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 the tithe is also, as we've learned, the divine connector to the blessing. Again, this vague idea. Most people think about the blessing as stuff, right? You go out, have a good meal. Notice in the parking lot, some super fast sports car you, you can't afford. And what do have, what have, what have half of us do in the room? Get on Facebook or Instagram real quick. Come on, shoot a picture of me next to the car and then hashtag blessed. <laughs> hashtag blessed. That's fake blessed. God wants to get you real blessed. But again, the blessing isn't about stuff. The blessing of God has never been about stuff. We've made it about stuff. The blessing of God is an ability. It's an ability for us. In fact, if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, the definition of the blessing. This is the first time God pronounces a blessing over his people. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Write this down. He said fruitful, always producing. Multiply, always increasing. Replenish, fill and refill. Subdue, control your environment before your environment controls you. I'll go over that again. To be fruitful, always producing. To multiply, always increasing. To replenish, to fill and to refill and to subdue, control your environment before it controls you. You want to know what the blessing is, what God ties you to in the tithe? This is it. This is the point. That God would give you an innate ability to constantly be faithful in being fruitful, to constantly be faithful into multiplying, that everything you touch is a multiplier effect, that you will replenish, meaning you will fill and refill whatever gets taken away from you, whatever you spend, whatever gets drawn out of your life through giving will be replenished, and that you will subdue. You will learn to control the environment around you before it controls you. This is the blessing. It's not hashtag blessed because you're standing in front of a Ferrari at an Outback Steakhouse. That blooming onion is good, though, isn't it? Dang it, I just got myself hungry. <laughs> That's dumb. This idea of the blessing... This connection to the blessing through our tithe is one of the reasons that we literally talk about tithing and offering every week. I know sometimes it gets old. I get it. I get it. Some of you are like, I've done this forever. I tithe. I give. Come on, pastor. Do we really need to hear about it? Yeah, you might not, but somebody does. Somebody needs to be reminded that when they give, they're not giving in vain. They need to be reminded that when they give based on biblical principles, that there's an expectation in return. In other words, God gave the end result before he ever gave the commandment. God said, here's the blessing. Here's what it looks like. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he gave the command to give. Then he gave the command. Now, I know there are some of you Bible nerds in the room are going, the New Testament doesn't talk about tithing. Doesn't talk about tithing. Jesus was light on the subject. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> Matthew 23 and verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You tithe mint, dill, and cumin with the smallest spices on your table. You neglect the weightier things 
of the law, justice, love, and mercy. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the other. Oh, what does Jesus do? He re-ups the tithe. He says that there's weighty things in the law, justice, love, and mercy. But don't not do the other part. Jesus reaffirms the tithe. You know how many times Jesus messed with their traditions? Screwed it up and changed it? He took Passover and messed the whole thing up. Now we call it communion. Jesus messed up baptism forever. These guys were supposed to get baptized in the water to follow a specific leader. And Jesus says, no, no, we're going to do baptism differently. You're going to go under the water and die and come up to do life. That's going to be the new significance. Jesus could have messed with the tithe. He could have said, I'm going to rewrite the rules a little bit, and this is how you need to tithe. I wish he would have. Because then I wouldn't have to preach this message. But he didn't. He said simply, there's weightier things. Don't let your religious mind forget the reason or the motivation behind everything that we do. However, don't forget the practical things. Don't just skip it because there's weightier things. Don't just skip it because your heart has to be right. Get your heart right and still do the practical stuff. Still do the things that have the promise attached to them. So maybe you're thinking, well, I thought the tithe was just to go to the Levite, the widow, the orphan, the sojourner. You might think that, reflect on the Old Testament a little bit, and you recognize that the tithe went to all kinds of different people. In fact, Melchizedek was the first person um, that the uh, tithe was ever given to, the king of Salem, the king of peace. You could make a correlation that it was a kind of a Jesus type and shadow, and that in that, there's a tithe being given to Jesus himself. Hebrews says that the old covenant is fulfilled in Jesus, so that if the old covenant is fulfilled in Jesus and Jesus doesn't do away with the tithe, then the purpose for the tithe is still for Jesus. Again, these are all reasons to rationalize in our brain the church just wants my money. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All scripture. It doesn't say some scriptures. It doesn't say the scripture you like. It doesn't say the scriptures that aren't about money. It says all scripture is good for what purpose? That we would be moved more to the character of Jesus. That it would train our heart in a different way. I hope you guys understand uh, my point in this. I'm not, again, this is not about manipulation. This is not about getting more money out of you. The tithe becomes that divine connector to the blessing. That we would be fruitful in everything that we do, that we would be multiplying in everything that we do, always increasing, that we would replenish, we would learn to fill and refill, and that we would subdue, we would control our environment before it controls you. I think there are too many people that their life is shipwrecked at times simply because they refuse to tithe. Does it mean you're buying God's blessing? No, it means you're hooking up with our, what's already there. God's blessing's here, and you're trying to get a power cord into it. And God says, here's the cord, tithe. And you went, oh, well, that's a snake. I don't want that. Don't touch me with that, Jesus. I want to do something else. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament. A prophet went to a, a king who was sick, boils and stuff all over his body, and said, ah, uh, you need to go jump in the Jordan a, bun a bunch of times. And he shook his head and said, I don't want to do that. And the prophet said, if I had asked you to do something great, you'd have done it. This was simple, and you didn't want to do it. Now you're going to be sick. So many of us, God says, do something simple. Just carve out a small portion of your income. Give to God. and Do that faithfully, and he'll do all these things for you. The blessing will come on you. It'll be overflowing in your life. You'll be called a prosperous people. And we went, mm, something, something else, Jesus. Something bigger. Let me do something big, grand. In fact, in the New Testament, we see Jesus rallying against these kinds of people. They decided they wanted to take their tithe and make it look more like alms. And from the street corner, they, they prayed and thanked God about all the poor people that they got to help. They showed off their giving. This is when Jesus says, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He was specifically talking to a religious group of people who were giving their alms on the street corner to the poor, and they're showing it off. Hey, look at what I'm doing. Look at the good deeds I'm doing. It'd be like taking your tithe 
going down to a soup kitchen, buying a big old bucket of soup, getting a big old Instagram photo and post and say, look what I did with my 10% this week. Blessed. Jesus said, don't do that stuff. Stop that. Don't operate that way. Understand the principle of what you're doing. It's not about giving just to get. It's not about giving to God just so the blessing's enacted. It's about obedience first. Tithing is about obedience because it doesn't make sense. I'm going to tell you what. When you take out 10% of your income and try to live on 90, it does not make sense. Every time I put that on paper, I go, mm, this ain't going to work, Jesus. He says, trust me. I said, okay. And it's always worked out. Oh, every time. Every time we've tithed, every time we've given, it's always worked out. You know what hasn't worked out? When I said, mm, I'm going to do it my way. Then things go crazy. Malachi 3.10. Then I will rebuke the devourer for your name's sake, and it, that it will not destroy the fruit of the ground, nor your vines in the fields, should they cast their grapes. Think about it for a second. Aside from the blessing, God also says I'm going to recession-proof your life. We're coming up on a recession, likely. I'm not speaking into existence. I'm just looking at the tea leaves. It says figure of speech. I'm not casting tea leaves. Look at the market, the market indicators. If we were falling to a, de uh, to a depression or recession, how many of you want to like, guard yourself from that? The Bible says the only way to do it is a tithe. He didn't say you can give alms, give to the poor, and it'll, it'll recession-proof your life. He didn't say you could give first fruits and it'll recession-proof your life. He didn't say you could give seed, a New Testament form of believing and giving, and it would recession-proof your life. He said tithe, tithe. You want your life to be recession-proof? Tithe. There's an old couple, some of you might have heard this story, A.W. and Vanetta Copeland, if you know who Kenneth Copeland is, these are his great, I think, great-grandparents or grandparents, I don't remember. But part of their marriage vows, and you might not like Copeland's, whatever, it's a good example. Part of their marriage vows was they put in their marriage vows that they would tithe. They would tithe. They made a covenant between themselves, their church, their community. Early, early on in their marriage, they would tithe. Now, they came up in the Great Depression, A.W. never went 24 hours without a job in the Depression. Never more than 24 hours. He had no education, no skills to speak of, but he was consistent in tithing. The man literally bypassed the Depression because in their wedding vows, they said they would stay committed to the idea of tithing. I don't need another story for me, like proof text on how this works. I don't need another one. Because when you can walk through a national depression and never go more than 24 hours without a job and you literally can point to one activity as to why that happened, you got me sold. You got me sold. Tithing holds us to God's promise. Again, Malachi chapter uh, 3 and verse 10, he says, test me now in this. So as he says he'll rebuke the devourer and make your life recession and depression proof, he also says that you should test him in it. God very... Very few times in scripture says, test it. Test it, boys and girls. Test me. But here he does. He says, go ahead. You don't believe it? Watch what I'll do. Just take a moment. Take your 10%. Give as God's instructed. Just take it and give it. And guess what will happen? I'll prove it to you. Prove it to you. This has always blown my mind that God would say this. Because he doesn't say it with so many other things. He doesn't say, when you're sick, test me on healing. Test me that I won't be a good God and heal you. He doesn't say that. I wish he did. He doesn't say when it comes to matters of rightness or righteousness or justification that we should test him and test his boundaries. He definitely doesn't say it in terms of his grace, that we should test his grace. In fact, Paul says, why would you test God's grace? But in the area of giving specifically tithing, he says, test me, prove me wrong. Isn't it cool that the God of the universe said, I'm going to lay something out in front of you that's not going to make any sense, and it might even look hard and almost impossible, and then I'm going to give you the answer to the puzzle. Prove me. Watch this. Watch what I'll do. 
I don't know if it's just fear or control as to why many of us never step out fully in, 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 in trusting God. I don't know what it is. Sometimes I think it's a little bit of both. But I know this, until we learn to jump out in all that God has for us, we will forever be hamstrung by what could be. We will look at scriptures and go, well, God, what about this? And what about that? And, oh, I, you know, you, you promised. You promised. These are, could have been scenarios, God, for me and for my life. And God's saying, yeah, but did you jump out? Did you do it? This idea, the church just wants my money, or better term, why isn't my giving working? It reminds me of a story that I heard, I don't know, a long time ago. A pastor walks into, he walks into a barber shop, and the barber and he get into a conversation, he's getting his hair cut, and the barber basically says, I don't believe in God. I know you're a pastor, I know you do the church thing, but I don't believe in God. If there was a God, why do all these bad things happen to so many good people? And like many of us, the pastor's having a hard time answering the question. <clears throat> he says, I, I get it, I understand why you feel that way, I'm sorry, but God's a good God and he loves you and he goes through all the generic ideas. He pays for the services, he walks out of the barber shop, and just as he's walking out, he sees a homeless man. And he asks the homeless man, would you like a haircut and a shave? The guy says, sure, why not? Walks him into the barber chair, sits him down, and he looks at the barber and he says, barber, there's no such thing as barbers, look at this man. Barber looks at him all funny. He goes, you know there's such thing as barbers. I just cut your hair, dude. What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? No, no. Look at this man. He's disheveled. His beard is long. There's no such thing as barbers. The barber gets angry with him and says, Pastor, it's just that he hasn't come to see me yet. <laughs> Too many of us judge God's word, what he's called us to do, the plans and purposes and standards he's put in front of us, and we throw our hands up and say, it doesn't work. And God's saying, test me in this. Come see me. Prove me. Test me. Just like that barber, we think to ourselves, mm, I don't think this works this way. I don't think it works the way that I've been told. And sometimes it takes a grisly mess to sit down in front of you before you recognize that you can trust God with what he said he'll do. In the context of the tithe, I'd rather live on 90% of my income blessed of God than 100% of my income outside of God's covering. I'd totally rather live on 90% knowing God's got it handled than 100% hoping, wishing, and wondering if it's going to work out. Now, some of you might be thinking, yes, but pastor, you got to understand, I have a relationship with someone and they don't believe like I do. Sometimes in the church, right? They both go to church at the same time. Y'all aren't on the same page. You can only do with what you have, right? We have had individuals in the church, particularly a young lady, uh, not too long ago, we talked about a series like this, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. And she was distraught because she didn't work. She was a stay-at-home mom, and her husband didn't believe in any of this. In fact, he wasn't really a churchgoer. She had a small income, an income here and there that she could maybe glean from, and we explained to her, it's a hard issue. You want to do the right thing. We know that. We can see that in you. And two, you can only be responsible with what you have. And so of the funds that she had control over, she would give of those funds. God blessed her mightily in amazing different ways. It's not about the amount. It's not, it's not about a, a zeros on a check. It's not about being perfect with it either. Like I know it's the standard seems super high and be consistent and all this stuff, and it's about consistency. It's about a heart attitude. It's about doing what God and, 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 and following through with God's, what God's called you to do. That's all true. You're not going to be perfect. We are not perfect. There's a time in our life because we were so offended at something that went on in church, we were going to show that church who's boss. Urgh. So we stopped tithing. You think they noticed? <laughs> no, of course not. And when they did notice, they asked us, hey, what's wrong? Because it seems like this isn't normal to you guys. And all we could do was talk about our frustration. It wasn't the right thing to do. The only persons in that scenario who got hurt were us. A hard heart built up, frustration built up. Why aren't they noticing? 
We've been faithful. Look, they don't even care. They cared. They also were smart enough to let us make our own dumb decisions for ourselves. And we did. You're not going to be perfect in tithing. You're not going to be perfect in your giving. Things happen. Life happens. Don't get frustrated. But understand that the mentality that we're trying to break from you through this entire series is the church just wants my money. The church, this church, and really most churches in America, could care less about your money. What they're trying to do when they talk about giving and biblical giving principles is to show you the systems that God has set up for you. Now, there's a reason that God chose money. Because it's connected to your heart. Some of you, I know it's connected, like with a, with a steel string. Because every time you reach for your wallet, you get chest pains. <laughs> and some of you are just that cheap. <laughs> It is cheap sometimes. But the fact of the matter is the Bible's clear. Wherever your heart is, or I'm sorry, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Bible says not to store up treasures where moth and rust corrupt and thieves can break in and steal, but store up your treasure in heavenly places. This wasn't about having an affection of heaven. This was about literally storing up treasures in heaven. How do you do that? Giving biblically. This is why we're here. We want to help you understand the principle of the tithe. We want to help you understand the principle of the other three types of giving. Again, tithing is the only one that specifically goes to the church. The rest of them are so fluid, it's amazing. And one goes right to another person. It doesn't go to an a, a institution. It doesn't go to religious services at all. It goes right to another, another person. It's not about asking money's permission to do God's will either. We don't talk about tithing or giving because we're trying to ask money's permission to finally do what God called us to. We talk about tithing and giving because we're trusting God in the promises that he's put forth in his word. We're trusting him. We believe him. That when he said, if you do these things, I'll be responsible on this end. We believe it. We're entrusted to that. So my question, my idea for today, is tithing really about money? Is it honestly about money? It's a money factor. But is it about money? No. No, it's about trust. Tithing is about obedience. That you can stand before God in one simple thing and say, God, I've done what you asked me to do today. And that by doing what God has asked you to do, that you can then stand in the promises of God. I can tell you flat out, I have watched people as their giving was where they needed it to be, where they were trusting God. And I don't mean perfect. Like some people weren't even tithing, you know, the full 10%. They're giving like 8%, 6%, whatever. But their heart was right, and they were giving in that motivation. And as they were giving, their life just seemed to, man, just seemed to increase and go well. I've watched some of those same people back off, and their life go to hell in a handbasket in a moment. And it's like, whoa, whoa, are you telling them they should buy the blessing? God forbid. No. But here's the power source. God's given you the cable to hook up to it. We're the ones that pull the plug from time to time. We all do it. Malachi told us so. We all have robbed God. Yes, we will. The entire group of us will do it from time to time. Don't get under condemnation because he quickly says, ah, we can fix this. Be consistent with tithing. Watch what God will do. So I want to encourage you today. As we talk through this series, The Church Just Wants My Money, I want to encourage you through this series, don't make it about money. I know money's in the title. We're going to talk about money a lot. Money, money, money. It's not about money. It's quickly become evident that the world around us wants to stamp this idea on the church that it's just after money, that it's just after funds, that it doesn't really care about people. Again, nothing could be further from the truth. Not only do we love people and care about people, not only do we, do we want to see people mature and grow, but we have principled ways to get you there. Some of them just happen to center around money. You know, if I were just a simple life coach, I'd say the same thing. Do you understand that the idea of generosity when it comes to finances begets generosity in finances? Some of the people who give the most in this world are given the most. And it's almost like a paradox we don't understand. In fact, in business schools, 
They teach men and women who are going into high-level leadership that they have to be philanthropic. They have to give. Because if they don't, it will hamstring their business. This principle isn't just a church thing. Now, the tithe, yes, but the principle of giving overall is not just a church thing. It's everywhere in our community. It's all over the business world. It's all over the guru self-help books that we need to learn to give. So I want to encourage you today as we learn to give, as we set our hearts differently on money and giving, recognize it's so little about money. Now, we don't do these series very often. We do them about every 36 months or so. There's a reason for that. You can get burned out in a hurry. Gosh, that guy just talks about money all the time. You can get burned out in a hurry. I don't want you to get burned out, but I can't let you go too long without recognizing and reconciling what money looks like, what giving looks like in your life. I can't let you go too long without recognizing the biblical principles of money in your life. Because if I do, I've not done my service to you as a pastor. Amen? Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to the word of God. We thank you that as we come, Lord, that you are inspiring us, you are encouraging us. God, that you are changing our hearts and our minds, especially regarding issues like money. God, help us recognize that even though there might be difficulty in some of these conversations, that it's not about money, that it's so much more than that. So Lord, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it changes our hearts and our minds and our attitudes. God, we just we just pray, Lord, that through this series we'll be lifted up in, a, in many different ways. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Everybody loves talking about money, right? <laughs>